The AMD FX6300 was featured in my second ever PC build here on the channel. If you're super interested in watching that super old video, you can do so by clicking the card right here, but brace yourselves. In all honesty, the processor wasn't very different from the i3-6100 I purchased shortly thereafter, and it was actually super cheap at 99 US dollars. You could probably get it for cheaper now. It features a unique design, three modules and two cores per module, effectively making it a hexa-core processor, although each core shares resources with another. So it's technically not a six core processor, but it is a six core processor. Separate issue, separate debate, separate video. The CPU boasts a whopping eight megabytes of L3 cache. That's actually how much my i7-6700K has, by the way. A turbo clock speed of 4.1 gigahertz, although I overclocked mine to 4.6 gigahertz with help from the NZXT Kraken X61. And as mentioned earlier, the thing's cheap, but it's also quite old. Vashira is a dying breed, it's undeniable. The AM3 platform is several years old, the chip flaunts 32 nanometer architecture, and the lineup isn't known for its relatively tolerable thermal output. Output. So with those pros and cons in mind, would pairing the FX6300 with AMD Radon's newest release, the RX480, be a good idea? Here's what you're about to see in the graphs. The FX6300 paired with the RX480, the FX6300 paired with the 980Ti, and the i7-6700K also overclocked to 4.6 GHz and paired with the same amount of RAM, 16 GB, paired with both cards as well. All games were benchmarked in 1080p, the FX processor wasn't digging 1440p in most of these titles, all of which were set to high settings with exceptions listed thereafter. By the way, I'll be using the newest Crimson Driver update from AMD with the RX480 in all of these tests. I have confirmed, I can confirm, that the RX480's power draw issue from the PCIe slot has been corrected. I threw it into the same $350 rig, and all the games ran perfectly fine, even with the $400 ultra-cheap power supply. I was going to make a separate video on that, but I really didn't think it would be all that entertaining. You're just going to be seeing all the games run, and that's pretty much it. So that's why I threw it into here. Don't worry. Problem solved. Now, a few of you were confused in the $350 AMD PC build video, which you can check out right here, by the way, because I included my i7 scores. I mean, obviously, the ultra cheap platform didn't stand a chance, but I included the i7 because that platform represents a quote-unquote no bottleneck situation. Now, that's not to say that nothing in the computer was a bottleneck. There's always a bottleneck somewhere. Remember that no matter how expensive the computer is, there's always a bottleneck. You just, you can't get rid of that. You're always going to have one thing holding back something else in the rig. But with the i7 in there, you can get a sense of how much the other CPU bottlenecks the graphics card. I've included the 980 Ti as well for the same reason. So you'll see four rigs and four sets of graphs. Make sense? All right, let's get to it. First up, as usual, is Grand Theft Auto V, which provides a great blend of CPU and GPU intensive segments throughout. Here we find the FX6300 falling a good ways behind the rest of the pack when paired with the RX480. So keep in mind, however, this platform is significantly cheaper than the other three rigs you're looking at here. Now, the bottleneck can be identified through various outlets. For one, the FX6300 plus 980 Ti combo is yielding frame rates that are nearly identical to the i7 plus RX480 combo. So even though the 980 Ti is about twice as powerful as the RX480, as of demonstrated in a video you can check out, by the way, right here, the FX processor is still holding things back quite a bit. And if you're thinking, well, of course, Greg, it's pretty obvious you're pairing a $90 CPU with a $400 GPU. I agree, it should be rather obvious, but we're trying to gauge exactly how much of a bottleneck this thing is. If we compare just the two RX480 rigs, it also becomes very clear. In Grand Theft Auto V, the FX6300 is cutting frame rates in half from that of an ideal CPU. But in case you're wondering, when it comes to strictly gaming, the differences between an i5 and an i7 when it comes to the frame rates you see in most games, I'm saying most because a few of them will take advantage of the extra threads. Uh, for the most part, the i5 experience will be roughly identical to the i7 experience. I've proven that in a video you can check out right here if you don't believe me, but take my word for it, if you have a decently overclocked i5 or even one that just has a really high turbo frequency, you're going to be yielding roughly the same frame rates as I am with the i7 rig, even though I have hyper threading on board and you may not. We should still be receiving similar frame rates, even though we have different CPUs. So you're welcome to test all the stuff on your own. That's why I show you all the settings and everything like that for every game so that you can go and do this on your own and see kind of where your stacks up to this rig right here that you're looking at and a rig that features the FX6300 and the RX480. 
Ashes of the Singularity tells us a different story. The multiple threads of the FX6300 keep it in the game, yielding an average frame rate of only 10 FPS lower than a processor that's over three times its price. It handles the 980 Ti fairly well too, and the 4.6 GHz overclock goes a long way here. Now in the case of Hitman, I would regard this game as a very GPU intensive one, and here's why. It doesn't stress the CPU to any unorthodox degree confirmed via MSI Afterburner. However, in DirectX 12 mode, those minimums can get pretty low, regardless of how expensive your rig is. This doesn't happen often, in fact you may not even notice the occasional dip at all, but it's there and was experienced in both platforms. This is another case in which the FX6300 holds its own, while obviously not i7 comparable, the 6300 plus 480 combo produced an average frame rate of over 60 FPS. FPS, so impressive in its own right. The CPU also handled the 980 Ti admirably. Check this out, only an 8 FPS difference between the two averages. The same margins exist for the maxes and mins as well. This game shocked me in a very good way. So then, let's get to the bad news. CPU intensive titles. City Skylines is one of them, much like the Total War and Arma series. This game led to some fairly depressing results. Here the graphics card choice didn't really make much of a difference. Folks, if you want proof of a CPU bottleneck, this is it. A $200 price difference in graphics graphics cards made almost zero difference in frame rates thanks to our FX 6300. Much of the same can be said for Rise of the Tomb Raider. Here, the minimum of the 6300 plus 480 combo is rather pitiful, as is the average, which considering the moderate settings, didn't even approach 50 FPS. Swapping the card for the 980 Ti improved things quite a bit though, seeing as though the average frame rates for these two are within 5 frames of each other. The minimums aren't as great, but again, this scenario is still very playable. To be fair, the 6300 plus 480 combo is also, I guess, playable, but only if you're comfortable with sub-60 FPS gameplay. I've included CSGO by popular demand and this one reveals its CPU intensive tendencies. As a rule of thumb, higher frame rates typically require more efficient central processing units. In this case, the FX6300 isn't technically bottlenecking anything, but simply switching to the i7 and DDR4 gave us an extra 70 frames on the average. So at this point, I imagine a few of you are ready to chew me out in the comments for what you just saw. Yes, I'm well aware that one platform was using DDR3 and the other was using DDR4. Yes, I'm well aware that RAM frequencies were vastly different. Do keep in mind though that DDR3 boasts significantly lower cast latencies, which also plays a huge role here. And yes, I'm well aware of the price differences between these platforms. The goal here was not to start a price to performance war, but rather to analyze the bottlenecking potential of the FX 6300 and its corresponding platform. With roughly everything else equal, you're looking at anywhere from a 20 to 50% frame rate bottleneck with the FX 6300 compared to that of a modern i5 or i7 with decent clock speeds. The rest of this conclusion must be sculpted by you. In your opinion, did the bottlenecks you've just seen with the FX processor justify its extremely low price point? AM3 platforms are old, I mean, they come equipped with PCIe 2.0 slots, and while that alone may not reduce frame rates by any substantial degree, it's a testament to how old these parts are even though you might decide to purchase them quote unquote brand new. As for me personally, I cannot wait to get my hands on some zen, whenever that decides to show up. If you liked what you saw in this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up, give it a thumbs down if you feel the complete opposite, or if you hate everything about life, be sure to click the subscribe button if you haven't already, and stay tuned for a change here in the studio. I'm sick of doing graphics card stuff. I'm gonna give that a break for a while. I do have a PC build coming up, sponsored by Deepcool and Cable Mod, but uh, for now, we're gonna do some other things. I don't I don't like doing the same stuff over and over, and just, you know, like I said, wringing this towel dry. It's, it's pretty much done for at this point. The RX 480 is a great card in my opinion. I would not fault you at all for purchasing one of the four or the 8GB depending on what you plan to do in the future. Uh, stay tuned for all of those new things that you're about to see on the channel. Be sure to leave feedback in the comment sections below. Stay tuned for the next one. This is Science Studio. Thanks for learning with us.